Hello everyone, thanks for attending this session. My name is Ning. I'm working as software engineer for Google Cloud. Our team is mainly responsible for maintaining the hypervisor and the virtual machine monitor inside Google and Google Cloud. Today, the topic of the talk is hypervisor-based integrity. As you can probably tell from the name, uh, we are trying to utilize the superpower given by the hypervisor and hardware to provide the guest kernels running inside the cloud environment. So some high-level disclaimer, uh, this is not a statement of direction or planted investment by Google yet. Uh, we are exploring this uh, as a possible security mechanisms and we are seeking feedbacks from the big communities. A background on why we are heading this way. So Google Cloud offer a product called Shielded VM. Um, in fact, that's the default VM type if you try to create a virtual machine inside Google Cloud. As you can tell from the name, it comes with some enhanced security features. Um, one of them called Secure Boot. Uh, on high level, in case you are not familiar with it, it provides integrity check against firmware, bootloader, and kernel during boot time. It will use the certificates and um, and to, to verify the signature of all the modules and has been sent correctly, all the drivers and all the binaries it's trying to load. So it gives you a guarantee like by the end of the boot, everything should be in a very good shape. Nothing has been modified has been, or has been hijacked in any way. After that, most kernel modules, if you try to load additional um, dynamic kernel modules, they will be protected by the module signings. So that's code in the, in the kernel, which will do signature, signature checkings against the module you are trying to load. That's all good. But uh, in real life, um, attackers can still find different ways to gain like highest privileges inside a running kernel. And if he can do that, and he can modify the code page, or Call back in some special way, like all oh, the security gate we put in place cannot be trusted, and we could put user applications in a risk state. The goal is trying to protect the kernel even at the runtime. Since we already have all these green box checked during boot, we are trying to extend what we can and help. Um, make sure like the kernel at runtime is also protected and can be trusted. If kernel has not been modified in any way and is running as expected, um, the user application can feel much safe about it. And one more thing is the protection we put in place. It can, should not be able to turn off from the guest. Because I mean, rootkit can gain highest privilege if he can change the settings in the guest to turn off the protection, then the protection is not that strong. So let's talk about the threat model here. So we assume the attacker has the following capabilities. So it can gain ring zero access. It can have arbitrary read and write permissions. So it can read and any kernel memory address and write any value to any kernel memory address. So how do we protect the guest kernel based on the thread model we just talked about? Um, first of all, we want to make sure there's no unintended modifications on the kernel code segment and read-only data segment. And this is very obvious. We have very well-written code. We don't want it to get replaced by some uh, molecular code. Second of all, we want to make sure the code execution, no code execution from other part of the kernel space. Um, data statement should always be read and write, but not executable. And yes, this is where um, buffer overflow attack happens, and we want to block that. And third, and we want to make sure there's no in intended modifications of key kernel data structures. Uh, for example, uh, system call table, which is a table of functional pointers. Hackers manage to replace it with something else. User may get monitored or hacked without realizing it. Um, another example is control register, like CR0 or CR4. There's a bit in the control register in the CR0 
um, which is read write protection. So, but if you turn off the bit, the kernel will the the, the processor will allow you to write to a read only memory, which is not ideal. And there's other MSR important MSRs like uh, there's a paper talking about system enter um, MSR and utilizing that the MSR they can hack uh, this some system calls. Of course, um, similar to system call table, there's a IDT um, interrupt descript descriptor table and GDT global descript table table. Both of them has some function pointers. We want to make sure it never get overwritten. Of course, uh, um, last but not least, we have the page table, which has the mapping from uh, virtual to physical. So if people hack the mappings, we can redirect the code execution to some other place. So why we want to use hypervisor as another security layer? Um, our understanding is there's always a risk of protecting guests from within the guest um, because we, we already did a lot of kernel handling work in the kernel space to make it harder and harder, but it's not guaranteed to be impossible. Rootkit or attacker can still gain like highest privilege and read and write any guest memories if they want. And it's not easy, but it's still possible. So anything we put in kernel space um, could be risky. And, but on the other hand, if we guarantee like kernel never changes, uh, kernel code never changes, then basically in return, it will make sure all the security checks we put in place be more robust. So this is not a replacement of all the uh, kernel handling work we have there. We hope this is just an enhancement layer, like to make sure whatever we put there um, is cracked and remain cracked for the entire lifecycle of the VM. Hypervisor, on the other hand, Hypervisor has almost one-to-one -one mappings to all the protection we want to achieve. Like Hypervisor can control read, write, execute bit or page aligned guest memory region um, utilizing the um, two-dimensional pagings like EPT or N NPT for AMD. We, we can set up the permissions which guests can never change. And Hypervisor can protect unsafe modifications of control registers and MSRs. We just configure the VM exit on those um, write to MSR or control register, and then we can do double check whether that's legitimate, legitimate or not. And Hypervisor can also protect the key kernel page table. <coughs> There's a new feature called Hypervisor Managed Linear Adjust Translation from Intel, which allow you to set up um, page table mappings controlled by Hypervisor and guests can never change it. And most importantly for us, um, for Google Cloud, um, all of our guests, all of our customer, customer machines are already running in a virtual machine mode. So we already have a layer underneath all those VMs. Uh, we are not trying to introduce another <clears throat> layer of complexity here. We are just using the existing layer to make everything more robust and more um, secure. So how does everything work end to end? Uh, here we want to introduce a new guest security kernel module. Um, this module should be loaded at boot time, ideally by the end of boot time. So we the kernel has already set up all the page table, IDT, GDT, uh, system call table, etc. It should be signed and protected by the secure boot, so it can be trusted at boot time. If anyone tries to modify it in some way, the secure boot will fail. And it, after it gets loaded, it will check whether the hypervisor supports um, special integrity protections. If it does, it will try to identify all the kernel code data segment and address of the key data structures and send a please protect me request to the hypervisor. And then it will need to wait, um, wait for the acknowledgement from the hypervisor because we don't want to jump into the runtime and so everything become a little bit out of control. During boot time, everything is still in control and in good shape. On the hypervisor side, um, during boot time, it needs to decode the memory segment information sent from the guest. We'll modify the second level translation table to set correct read, write, execute bit for the specific memory region. And it will configure the VM exit on MSRs and control registers. After that, it should acknowledge the request and let it continue to boot. 
we it's just a few actors we need to call so it should not have significant impact on gas boot during runtime um the hypervisor and qmu or vmm will just um handling ept and npt access valuations and if that happens user can config one of the following actions and either kill the running vm and dump all the memories to analyze that's for the people like who care a lot about the security and want to make sure nothing wrong should happen and for majority of users we would expect we will just log up critical event and notify the user and let them decide what they want meanwhile on the other hand like we do the same thing for the control register and the msr modifications and you may be wondering like you know in runtime we can add dynamic kernel modules so those kernel modules are executable so how do we handle that um our recommendation is is much safer to do not do that but if you have to do that and um, we have apis exposed by the guest module so we'll modify the kernel code a little bit so first of all the kernel code will allocate um read and writable memory region then copy binary into it and once the as as once the verification is done, it will call the API to change the code segment of that memory region to be read and executable. So I probably will make sure like the code segment never change after the first time you load the kernel module. You may wonder like what's the performance impact since we are doing a lot of stuff here. Um, for memory access, the impact should be minimal. Uh, mainly because we have support through the hardware, Intel EPT or AMD NPT. If there's no validation happens, there should be no impact at all. But if something happens, I think it's, it's okay to, pro to pay some extra cost on the VM exit to determine whether the operation is legitimate, legitimate or not. And from our prototype, prototyping and testing, those do not happen very often if that's if it is a healthy kernel for control register and msr um, the module specific register the impact should also be minimal and we because we don't expect a lot of modifications on a typical kernel runtime if you are running a nest virtualization is completely another story so we we don't expect we don't recommend people turn on this if they, they are running into these scenarios and for the PG table translation, <coughs> it need hardware support, um, but currently only limited to Intel Elder Lake. So it's not there yet. Um, we cannot match it. It sounds uh, straightforward, but it has a bunch of um, technical challenges. Um, two major ones is like how do we distinguish between legitimate, uh, legitimate uh, kernel modifications? There's a bunch of reasons uh, you can see we list here. Uh, kernel want to modify itself. And we need to work with our customer to either disable those, disable those um, special scenarios in their image, or we need to decode the instruction pointer and go through a call stack and whitelist those operations. Another major problem is when set memory permission not all segments are nicely aligned. If we have one page, because when we set permission, it's on the page level. If we have one page that is shared between a code segment and data segment, it will be very hard for us to set correct permission on it. And um, we will have a potential problem here. So to mitigate this issue, um, some change in the kernel need to happen to make sure like all the code segment, all the different segment of kernel um, is nicely aligned. So here is a quick example of what it looks like if we turn on the protection. We have a guest running on Debian 10. After the kernel boots, we map the entire kernel code segment as read and executable. We got a bunch of EPT violations right away. Um, but if we go through the core stack for each of them, it comes back to the same function, which is a text book. Um, the description of this function clearly says it's trying to update instruction on live kernel. So this is a valid case for kernel modifications. 
after we remove of that particular module, the, after that, the gas running smoothly without any further violations. This is a, this is a very good example to show you like, if we config uh, the image correctly, any violations, any access violations will be a strong hint of possible attack. Now let's talk about um, to support the protection we just mentioned. What are the changes we need for KVM and QMU? And first of all, we want a common interface to turn on the protection. As you can see, uh, during boot time, the guest agent is sending some message to the hypervisor and the VMM. So currently, we are using a uh, select MSR for these configurations. Um, it's not ideal. If we can make uh, allocate a special hype call just for this purpose, um, it will show that this is for VM only, and it will, it will avoid a lot of confusions. And once people agree on the interface, API, what the hype call looks like, any hypervisor or VMM can implement the support for this API to provide the same level of protection, no matter where or the VM will be landing, uh, like Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud, or QMU, they can all implement the same APIs, so the guests can move freely around different uh, providers and gain the same level of protection. Uh, we have a RFC uh, sent out a while ago, so that's for adding a HAP call called ABM HAP call U call. So this is a hype call we want to tell the hypervisor to, to hand over to BMM to handle this uh, special hype calls. We have a link and you guys can review it. Um, so why we need this change? So today all the hype call are handled inside KVM. It never costs any VM exit. And but we want hype call to pass, we want a hype call interface to pass a control back to the VMM. Why we want VMM to handle this request instead of KVM? Uh, because VMM is, is responsible for setting up uh, the guest memory mapping and should have knowledge or should control the permission associated with it. And what's more important is it can simplify the support for live migration because uh, during live migration, VMM could just create the same guest memory region, apply the permission because it has knowledge of everything. And, and we can keep the KVM simple. KVM just need to expose the API we need to turn on the protection and all the status is maintained in the VMM instead of KVM. So once we have the hype call um, defined, we want to define the message um, sending from the guest to VMM. This is a simple proposal we put here. We want, um, we want to call it HBI uh, request. It's a hypervisor based integrity request. And we have a version and operation code. So for operation, um, it can be set memory protection, et cetera, et cetera. We can extend it for feature usage. And for the memory, uh, for the message body, um, it only needs to tell us what's the PFN, page physical number, how many number of pages you want to protect, What's memory permission you want to set on this on those pages? And for the memory permission, it can be read and read and execute or read and write. So never allowed execute and write happen at the same time. And once the, the request is complete, uh, gets able to uh, get the result from this written code. So that's for the protocol, um, for the guest VMM communication protocol. Uh, other than that, um, they correctly set the memory permission. We need to call the KVM set user memory region IFTOR. Because unfortunately, today the current call only supports setting the memory as read and executable. But we want read and write, not executable. This is something that did not support today. We will try to extend it. And we also want to expose the ability to do VM exit on um, control register modifications because there's a lot of bits we want to protect there. And the hardware 
and tell AMD this part, if you config, for example, the VMCS correctly, we can get the exit on, for the, uh, on control register 0 or control register 4. And we want VMM to make this call whether we let the modification to go through or we should not. And last, um, this is basically support the new Intel hypervisor managed linear address translation. Uh, since it's new hardware, I don't see what is there. Um, I hope Intel or um, some committee members or us will work on the support for this together. And for the future, once we have the um, the protection we talk about um, in place, we can extend um, this guest QT module to expose APIs for any kernel code to consume. Uh, it can be a driver, it can be a security a hardening code inside the kernel, so they can call the API during boot, allocate a memory, and write to it, and then mark it as read only. So we will send this a memory segment to the hypervisor at the end of boot and then we make sure those memory will never change during the entire lifetime of the VM. So yeah, all the kernel security and driver modules can take ad advantage of this to protect themselves. Now let's talk about um, some other security considerations. So first of all, all the protection we talk about today is built on top of secure boot. If secure boot is broken, um, our guest agent could be changed and we cannot trust the message is sent to us. So why can we trust secure boot in Google Cloud? Um, for Google Cloud, all the guest firmware, like the UV firmware, is actually immutable. We inject the guest firmware during boot time, we copy it into the guest memory, um, so even if you manage to change the firmware in some special way during runtime, after you reboot, you will get a fresh piece of firmware and it will restore back to the good state. A lot of uh, firmware integrity check is actually happening outside the guest. Um, we know that's a critical piece of code. Um, we want to make sure it's doing what we expect. So a lot of security check, uh, signature check is happening. We upload those all those logic into the VMM processor is not happening inside the guest. And for important security boot variables, primary keys, signatures, they are stored on a remote server instead of your local disk. So there's no way a guest can skip UV and skip our firmware to modify the, those variables directly. One popular attack against secure boot is through system management mode or the SMM attack. Um, to reduce the attack surface, uh, the SM SMM is completely dropped from Google Cloud. We don't support it at all. But the protection is not perfect. Even if we guarantee the kernel code stays the same through the entire runtime and nothing gets executed outside this kernel code space, there's still possibilities people can use something called the return oriented programming drop attack. Um, what it does is trying to find some instructions on your um, executable region and chain them together to achieve some special goals. Um, for example, if people use drop attack to modify the kernel, kernel page table, it will still break the protection because um, you can modify the, the page table translation and point the kernel code to a different memory location. And if that happens, um, that memory location is not is no longer protected by any EPT or NTP, so uh, the hacker can do whatever they want there. To mitigate this problem, um, I think kernels just randomization is uh, very popular today. It make rub attack a little bit harder, and there's ongoing work for the kernel control flow integrity to make sure make it harder to happen or make sure it never happen. And there's hardware support like the hypervisor managed uh, linear address space translation we talked about earlier, where you can make sure the address space, address space translation is happening on the hypervisor side. So that's can avoid people hack this page table in some special way. Um, to summarize this presentation, uh, we are trying to propose a hypervisor based 
uh, mean forced protection for gas memories and system registers. And we want to we also provide a parallel virtualization uh, interface um, to enable and to enable this in protection. And we want to enable secure security by default. Um, this is happening we are proposing here is to extend this queue boot and provide runtime protection for kernel integrity. Thanks, that's it.